Well, hi there. This is John Byrne, and it is Fridays with Sandy at Poets and Quants. Sandy Kreisberg, HBS Guru founder uh, and wizard on MBA admissions. We have a great candidate in New York, uh, Sasha, who has a 710 GMAT, a 3.6 GPA from Rutgers in finance and economics. For the last five and a half years, he's been working for a boutique renewable energy company where he's a program manager. He's a first gen college student and he is applying to Harvard, Wharton, Chicago, Yale, and Kellogg. Say hello and then in your own words and quickly tell us your story beginning in high school. Sure, sure. Hi everyone. Uh, My name is Alec. I'm uh, 32 years old, Um, graduate from Rutgers University with a degree in finance economics. Um, I moved to the US um, pretty much five and a half years ago, been working for the same company um, in renewable energy sector and I'm, I'm currently employed as a program manager. Um, my past experience um, includes uh, playing rugby professionally in uh, Europe for, um, for pretty much the same amount of time, five, five and a half, six years. Yeah, so you're 32, you've got uh, five years of, of professional rugby experience and then five years working for Dobtal, which is a what company? And, and do they usually send people to business, people from there go to business school? Yes, um, it's a power slash renewable company that's also in, in construction. So what we do, we pretty much build uh, solar farms, um, parking uh, canopies um, and solar rooftops. And um, yeah, that's valuable experience. That's something everybody's interested in. That seems to be the yeah. wave of the future. So we're calling that a uh, hot, solar hot, <laughs> very solar hot. hot, solar hot industry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I don't, uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself. It happens when you're my age. Uh, what, what, what's the what's the size and the revenues of your company, Dobtal? Um, it varies greatly from year to year since it's, uh, it's a very uh, high growth industry, but I would say in a ballpark around 250 million in revenue. Okay. So we're, they call that a medium sized company, isn't that right, John? Yeah, that's good. So it's a medium sized yeah. company. It's a company that uh, the admissions offices will probably not ever have heard of, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah, because they don't hire MBAs. You, people from there don't go to MBA school. So you're, you've got some explaining to do. Not that that's bad, but it's just something you've got to do. You've got to explain it. Okay, so 32 years old, pretty okay stance, 3, 6, 7, 10, working for this uh, solar company for five years, if that's right, and then a uh, professional athlete. How do you think that weighs on the scales here, John? I think that adds a lot, uh, the fact that he's a professional rugby player in Europe. Uh, you know, it requires a lot of team sport. It's, there's a lot of discipline. That is a tough sport. That's not an easy thing. Like, yeah, I agree with, I agree with all golf. that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with all that. You know, the, pe- people, the, the, the people who recruit at, at, at business schools are jock sniffers, but the ladies in the admissions office – how would you, where would you put them on the jock sniffing scale from one to 10? Well, low, low, but on the other hand, I think that they would admire someone who played at that level for six years in Europe. That's a big deal. Yeah. Okay. What would you, su- suppose I said, what, boy, you, you, you played six years of, of uh, professional rugby. What, what value could you bring to your business school class based on that experience? In a neutral way, I, I'm not cynical. I'm just asking the question: What, 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 what are the influences of that? What, what could you contribute based on that? Yeah, and I would say definitely being the part of the part of the team and learning how to be an efficient leader. Um, that would be probably number one, and and number two is, is yeah. What was the best leadership lesson you had from that experience? Um, I guess. Uh, um, once you're not good enough, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't try and get into a team. Since I was uh, 16 when I, when I tried first time, to get, um, first time to get into a seniors national team. And I was just too young, to be honest. And um, oh, well, that's an interesting story. What's that got to do with leadership? 
you said you learned a leadership lesson from being on a professional team. So yeah. what, what, what leadership, you know, is traditionally understood means, you know, working with and through people. So yeah. an athletic team is a classic uh, venue for leadership. So what, what was your greatest leadership lesson? This yeah. is a valuable thing to have in your pocket when you do an interview or even write your... Yeah. Um, well, definitely in a couple of instances, I learned that um, it's really uh, valuable to, to make, the, make the decision at the right time in a very short span of time. And numerous times, as, as you probably know, uh, sports is full of it. I made, a, I made a wrong decision. But it's just what I, what I, could, what I could get out of it. And, and grow myself to be. Yeah. Hey, Alex, I'm, I'm on your I'm on your side. I'm impressed with all this. You, you're really not answering the question. You're not even coming close. The question is, tell me a leadership lesson. And you go, you know, a, a leadership lesson I learned was that you you got to lead. You got to you got to say no. When I started in a leadership role on the team, I was I was trying to say yes to everybody, and it just didn't work. And then after my first year, I said, okay, I got to lead. And when I say no, these guys actually respect that. Okay, I just made that up, but that, that's a good answer. Do you follow me? Yeah. You've got anything like that? Um, yes, you yes. Got, you got anything like that, man? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I, can, I can pretty much talk about when I, uh, when I entered the, the, the senior team, I was the, the youngest player. And when I tried to communicate and, and to, to the rest of the team, and some of them were – where my uh, my seniors they they didn't listen. So after after a couple of games where I where I had to prove myself, uh, they did notice me. So next time when I try to lead, I think they I think they did. They just need a little bit of uh, persuasion on the field. So the leadership lesson is if if you don't succeed at first, try try again. Um, and in my sports that, that was it. Never give up. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, that's, that's a passable answer, okay? Just for the folks at home, leadership to business school means working with and through others. So when people, when business schools ask for a leadership experience, you, what they want was, I was once leading a cross-functional team of four people. And one of the things I learned was you had to talk to different part, different people in this group in different ways. The, the marketing people would listen to this kind of thing, but the technical people needed a different approach and you had to make sure you were supporting both groups. Okay, it's just made up crap, but that is a leadership story, quintessential leadership story of working through others. So now here's another one, Andy, one that yeah. you can ask. What is your leadership style in your current job? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would definitely say that I, that I like leading by example. And specifically in this firm, I've been working for the last five and a half years. And there, there are many, many spheres of, of firm that I was actually a participant before becoming a project manager. And for some, some team members, that's, that's really important. So I cannot just tell them what to do. I've been through all that and I've been doing it. So, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty important point to me. Yeah, you could make that story a lot stronger if you were able to give some color to who the team is. This thing about, you know, the teams in my company, it's, my company is a, 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 a high-tech company, and there are a lot of people with engineering backgrounds. I, I assume that's true, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you make that point, then you can say, you know, engineers are motivated in different ways than managerial types. So for engineers, you could say something, but they, they really prefer to, you know, you've got to act it out and, and lead by example. That, that just brings color to the story. You've got to situate yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, so the question in a way is how do you overcome age in the fact that you're not from a feeder undergraduate institution or a feeder employer. Yeah, it's being a professional athlete and working for a no name but interesting company and being 32 years old. How do you overcome that? 
with okay stat, you know, with normal stats, three six and a seven ten. So, so the cards in the deck say, first gen is a card he plays. Professional athlete is a card he plays. Having come from, is it Serbia? Um, yes. Born okay, in Serbia, but, uh, a very diverse background. Mom and yeah. dad. I mean, and that's another card to play, yeah. frankly. Okay. Since you've, you've only been in the States for five and a half years. You speak okay. Hey, 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 Alex, give me your blah, blah, blah about what you want to do when you go back to Serbia. Yeah, well, I would, I would definitely like to, to help the Eastern Europe to, 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 um, to grow in, in terms of, since all of those countries are developing countries and, and definitely would like to, to be a part of it, a, a meaningful part of it, whether or to open my own company or work with uh, entrepreneurs. On okay, here's a question I say every week, nobody ever answers <laughs> and we'll continue it. You wanna guess at this, John? Who's a, give me, give Roll me your, Who's a role model for you? Uh, for me, it has to be. I don't mean Bill Gates either. I mean, Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I think that's that's about right, John. And, uh, yeah. No role model in terms of someone who has an MBA and has gone back to Serbia and done good things, or just a powerful leader in Serbia or the uh, whatever they call Eastern that. Europe. Eastern, yeah. Eastern yeah. Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know a person, he, his name is uh, Vuk Jeremic. So he was the, the former Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Serbia, and he was the, the, the council chair member for the United Nations. But he did pretty much, he worked abroad in the United States and England, and he, that's where he used to live. Um, however, after his uh, career ended, he came back to Serbia probably two and a half, three years ago. He opened up his own company over there, and he's helping uh, poor communities to um, to grow. Okay, that's um, that's okay. It's not it's not perfect, uh, but the, the, he's a Serbian. He's a he's a uh, an Eastern European leader. I admire. That yeah. could be yeah. a that could be a, a, an interview question. Who's who's a leader you admire from the region? So give me your answer for that guy. Try and make it concise. Um, it would definitely, it would definitely have to be uh, Vuk Jeremic. So he's the he's the former uh, chairman of the United Nations Assembly and the former uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of of Serbia. Uh, not only did he manage to distinguish himself abroad in the United States and England, but he also made a significant impact uh, when he came back to Serbia three and a half, uh, three three and a half years ago. Um, he started his own company. And he's uh, he's helping uh, poor communities and um, economics to um, to grow. Okay, that, that's acceptable. Yeah. Here, here's a here's a very frequent interview question and one that you should be able to uh, answer. What, what what do you want your classmates to know about Serbia, beginning with where the hell it is? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, Americans starters, are champions by geography, yeah, right? <laughs> for starters, it's in uh, it's in Eastern Europe, and it's a very it's a very small country with a very rich history. Um, it's one of the first uh, countries that introduced the um, the alphabet in in Europe, and it has the said, that, that's uh, that's has going back a ways. Number one tennis ranked player in the world, Novak Djokovic. Yeah, okay, those are the alphabet and, and a tennis star. Let's, let's now, those are good. Let's try and get more basic here, okay? So, I mean, one, one of the things you the answer is the hard Serbia, Serbia is, a, is located in Eastern Europe. It used to be part of the Soviet Empire. When that broke up, it became, in, I'm making this up, but yeah. this is, you know, it became independent in the year blah, blah. It's, yeah. it's major I, industries or blah and blah, stuff like that, man. Can, it's I, like a, can I ask a, like a very, very conversational Wikipedia entry? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let's say I'm actually interested now. Um, what do you want your classmates to know about Serbia, including what, it, you know, what it's like to do business, your business school classmates? Yeah. Well, Serbia is, is located in Eastern Europe and it was part of the, the former Socialist Federate Republic of Yugoslavia until 1992. 
Um, unfortunately, in 1992, there was a huge civil war um, where I was, I was also, um, back then I was living in, in Croatia and had to, um, to migrate to, uh, to Belgrade, Serbia, and then to Hungary. Um, right now, it's a developing country. Um, it has uh, democratic leaders that were elected in, um, in such fashion, in democratic fashion. And um, to be honest, it's moving forward pretty quickly. I think it's one of the five uh, countries in Europe with, uh, with the largest uh, growth per, uh, per capita. And, and um, your family was dislocated by the Civil War, yes? Um, yes, yes, sir. How did it impact your upbringing? Uh, well, for starters, we, we moved quite a lot. I believe when I was uh, still a toddler, we, I mean, we moved uh, three times in, in five years. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it definitely um, amped up my uh, interest in rugby. So that was kind of my escape form uh, from that. So I started playing rugby at the age of six. Um, I signed the first uh, semi-professional deal at the age of 16 and the first professional deal at the age of 18. <laughs> so it had a huge, it had a huge impact. Yeah. All right. Drum roll, please. You want to know okay. your so What are you thinking? What are you thinking here? I, I know what I'm thinking. I want to know what you're thinking. Yeah. Which do you want to hear first, uh, Alex, the good news or the bad news? <laughs> I would say the bad news first. Oh, wait. That's right. 32-year-olds, 3'6", 7'10", working for a uh, very interesting but not feeder company. I think your chances at HPS are going to be hard. Uh, if, if you could get into HPS, you, you'd have to craft a perfect application that explained all this, showed that you and proved to them that you're going to be an impactful leader but back in Serbia and also show them what a roadmap for you is. I just think it's going to be hard. I think Wharton is the same analysis. I mean, it says he's <laughs> then, that he's going to be able to go back to Eastern Europe and become one of its leaders in reimagining that region of the world. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll buy that. They'll, they'll just, you're going to have a really hard time overcoming the EBA, EMBA issue. I mean, you can say, I want it for this and this, but they lean back in their chair. And if they say, you know something, this guy is really an EMBA, there's just no talking to Matt about it. How about GMAT? If I... It's fine. No, you're, don't, don't you're good. It. Don't worry about that. Yeah. You it's don't fine. need to do that damn test yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, 730, when, it's not going to make a dime's worth of difference. So that, that's my analysis. So I think your chances at Harvard and Wharton are, uh, you know, maybe in like we're talking 20%. Uh, it's possible a guy like you could do magic at Stanford. You're, you're, if you could turn this into an overcoming adversity story and a save the world story and they believe it, who, who do you have? writing your recommendation. And what you've got to do is you, you just have to very strongly present yourself as someone who is going to be a very impactful leader in the country and the region. So Sandy, the way I, I hear you, you actually think he may have a better shot at Stanford than Harvard. No, I'm just saying that Okay, that, that would be a magic bullet. Yeah. That, so that, would be, that would be the way to form a magic bullet, whether it would hit the target or not. Gotcha. So of the schools he is targeting, which is his, his best shot, do you think? Yale. Yale? Yeah. I mean, it's the easiest to get into, and they go for this stuff. Am I, aren't I right, John? Uh, I think they'll, they'll like your international background. I think they'll like your post-MBA ultimate goal after MBB. I think they'll like you know, the fact that you were a professional athlete. Yeah, yeah all of that. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a place you should get in. I mean, the, the, to me, the big th uh, question, frankly, is your application strategy. Should you do these target schools or should you do pick two of them as, as I don't know what the equivalent of a Hail Mary pass is in rugby, but whatever that is, <laughs> and, then, and then look at schools like Darden, Michigan, Duke, UCLA, Dartmouth, Tuck. 
Now, why? Because they're less elitist institutions that care less about the feeder uh, undergraduate degree and the feeder company, uh, and they're more flexible on age, okay, for a full-time MBA. Uh, where some of the, sco the schools that are your targets are less flexible on all three of those dimensions. And they're more highly selective. And incidentally, Michigan, Darden, Duke, UCLA, and Tuck will all get you to MBB. They'll get you an interview there. In yeah, the yeah, yeah. The John makes a good point. You, in many ways, going to any school is valuable. Going to any top school is valuable for you. Yeah. You, you, don't get me wrong, you know, believe me, what are the best schools you get into? But in, 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 in your case, the difference between not getting into Harvard is not a super big deal. Yeah. If you, your dreams can come true at any top 10, top seven. School. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. So, uh, you know, rather than, I mean, it's about investing time, right? So should you be investing time on all long shots or should you be changing up your strategy a little bit just, just to make sure you can get into schools that are going to allow you to fulfill your dream? Great. All right. So good luck to you. Uh, Sandy, thank you very much. And for all of you out there watching Friday with Sandy, we'll be back next week.